for the uh, last video cast for the Radiation Research Society meeting in 2014 in Las Vegas. And we're going to finish with Rebecca Abergel, uh, who is at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. She works on the corporation and uh, she's also a good friend and colleague since I'm also at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So welcome, Rebecca. Thanks. And Alison is with us again. So um, I think, Rebecca, you work on a topic that actually has not uh, been the center of the Radiation Research Study for many years. It's uh, looking at uh, the impact of internal exposure uh, as most of us work on more external exposure, x-rays and, and high LET radiation. So um, do you want to talk a bit about this field? Because uh, it's not a, that right. well known. So it's, it definitely has not been a focus on, on, of the Radiation Research Society. So we are looking at the health effects of internalized radionuclides. So in an event of contamination with a variety of radionuclides, what happens, what kind of dose is delivered, where are the um, radionuclides located, what's the health effect or really the biological damage. And um, on the other hand, we're also developing some decorporation treatments so that we can actually help the excretion and removal of those radionuclides to minimize the dose that um, people would receive because of that internal contamination. So how does it work exactly? You, uh, you, you use different uh, compounds for different type of exposure, uh, type of chemical, for instance? Yes, so we're, um, in my research group, we're focused on lanthanides and actinides. They're the F elements at the bottom of the periodic table. Actinides are all radioactive. Uh, lanthanides have some radioactive isotopes. They're all found in um, nuclear fuel um, waste, mm -hmm. waste forms, so they're, a lot of fission products. Um, we're not really looking at cesium, iodine, or strontium yet because the properties are very different. Um, and so we're really um, coming from the coordination chemistry aspect and that those elements have certain coordination chemistry properties and we're developing molecules to have a very high affinity for those metal ions. Um, and so depending on which element we're targeting, we might want to tune the chelating agent um, or its molecular structure so that it has a higher affinity for that particular element. I see. Is this all gamma radiation? No, it's mainly alpha emitters. I was going to say, because mm -hmm. that's the most dangerous. Well, it's the most dangerous when, you, when um, internalized, it. yes. yes. Um, because they, you know, they alpha emission can be shielded with a, a sheet a, of... A piece of paper. A piece of paper, yes. but once it's inside, and um, it can really do a lot of damage locally. Yeah, it's high LET, so once yeah. it's in, it's not, not good news. Okay. So uh, how do you know um, that your chelating agent is working? What kind of metrics do you use? <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in vitro, or for the development of those compounds, we do a lot of solution thermodynamics. Um, so looking really at the binding constants of those, um, of those molecules for such or such metal ion, but then we actually have a, a lot of um, animal work um, so we are using different models. We're using a lot of uh, rodent models. We are also using dogs to look at the biokinetics of the radionuclides um, post-contamination and post-treatment. So depending on what kind of treatment you give them after the contamination, um, how long you wait between the contamination and the treatment, what the dose you give um, for the differently contaminated animals, you'll see different excretion of the radionuclides depending on the animal species as well um, and the element of course. So we are working a lot with different animal models um, and we are detecting the elements as radio tracers so we're just doing um, uh, metabolic balance studies. Mm -hmm. um, so we're in contaminating the animals on purpose uh, with a certain activity and then we're looking for activity in the different organs or in excretion and then we just put this back together um, at the end. So, um, and is there any other kind of metrics, like biological metrics that you could use for monitoring these? Yes, <laughs> since you bring this up. <laughs> so we're, um, most of the work that has been done over the past, I would say 50 years in that field is really looking at radioactivity. Um, so looking at the biokinetics of those elements, because of you know, the emergence of all those new techniques, um, biological methods, looking at gene expression, so all the genomic um, tools that we have accessible now, we can, design, we can start designing a lot of new studies and people are 
I've started doing this over the past, I would say, three to five years. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that we've started doing is looking at gene expression after contamination, for example. Um, can we correlate this to radiation damage or chemical toxicity, depending on which element we're looking at or which isotope we're looking at? Um, we can also do proteomics, looking at which proteins are involved in the uptake, transport, storage of those metal ions, right? They can't just be diffusing through the body. They have to be attaching to some biological ligands. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're looking at certain proteins like iron transport proteins or calcium binding proteins um, that may be involved in the binding of those metal um, ions. We're uh, we also want to look at DNA damage, of course, <laughs> so you would know about this. So what happens, how can we really compare um, the biological effects after contamination with external exposure to radiation or with um, exposure to heavy elements? So mm -hmm. that would be chemical toxicity. So let's uh, step out and talk about something that happened in Fukushima, uh, because I think it's, it's very relevant to your work. Um, so we, we talked to other investigators at this meeting, and they have that work done on uh, the impact of uh, you know, cesium, for instance, that's uh, located in the plants. And, and so here it's interesting because you have, that, um, you have both internal and external exposure at the same time. So are you doing this kind of study in the lab where you're looking at animal cancer study with a combination? And do you see some lethal combination? Right, well, we, that's where we are going to start. Um, doing this year, <laughs> in fact. Um, so we're, we're going to compare external exposure with cesium, internal contamination with cesium. So that's the, one of the elements um, that was the most worrisome after Fukushima. Mm -hmm. And um, try to model the biokinetics, but also the damage so that we can actually correlate um, or establish correlations between the external exposure and the internal exposure um, to radioactive elements. And so that way we might start understanding you know, if the combination is more impactful than just having one or the other, or you know, what, what kind of health effects you might expect from such event. Um, and so we're going to do this in animal models, but also in different cell lines, so that we may also use human cell lines to extrapolate um, to the scenario of human contamination, since it would be very highly un unethical <laughs> to contaminate people on purpose just for such studies. So I know it's a different type of radiation, but the Fukushima uh, nuclear accident, um, there was some work that we talked about uh, earlier in an, a previous podcast by Asako Nakamura, where she looked at the DNA damage of livestock in the area. And um, these livestock were not only being um, exposed to radiation from outside, but they were also uh, ingesting this radiation and having internal exposure as well. Do you ever look at right? At so, other types? so one of the elements again that was very important in the Fukushima accident is cesium. So there was a lot of in, or potential for internal contamination with um, isotopes of iodine, cesium, and tellurium. And so cesium was the uh, most prevalent one. Um, we're again we're starting to look at this element. So we're not really focusing on the type of. Um, radioactivity that comes out of those elements more than we're really looking at the chemical properties of those different elements, even though they're all radioactive isotopes. Because we're taking a chemistry approach to understanding what's happening, we're really looking at the elements. And because then, these are gamma emitters versus right, the alpha exactly. emitters. Exactly. And, and so I, I think the then once you start looking at the biological effects, um, you know, the radioactivity is going to matter um, depending on which type of emission you're looking at. Um, but yes, cesium is definitely one of the elements of interest and um, one of the elements that has been used in a lot of different studies in the past too, m much more than the transuranic um, actinides that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to add to this, but in the work of Asako, um, she was showing that the DNA damage were, you know, picked up. Mm -hmm. half a year after the uh, initial incident. So yes. I think what would be interesting is with your technology and your work, we, you could, you know, the big question we had for her was that, are those persistent damage or are those reflecting some kind of ongoing contamination and that basically they're carrying this stuff inside of them? Right, and one thing we could do, the type of experiments that we're thinking about right now is looking at the contamination and, you know, DNA damage and all, all sorts of biological effects that you can evaluate post-contamination, but also if those are reversible after we've given um, a decorporation treatment. Um, so that would be very interesting to assess. If, right. you've, if you've 
done damage once you've been um, internally contaminated um, and if that is staying at, even after you've removed the radionuclide or if this is reversible and you can really impact the health effects by decorporating the radionuclides. Well, in the, the animals that Asako was looking at in particular were the, these cows mm -hmm. and she was saying that the cesium in particular was being incorporated into the muscle of, of these cows. Now, the, the radionuclides that you're working with, is there um, a limit to the chelating agents that you know, of an area of the body, such as the muscle that's very dense, that maybe these cleaning agents wouldn't be able to reach? Right, so the lanthanides and the actinides have a very high affinity for the bone matrix. <laughs> um, and so we know all of the biokinetics of all those, the, those elements, and we know that after, let's say, 24 hours post-contamination, they'll start accumulating in, in the bone, um, and it becomes harder to remove them at that point. Um, and so this is really one of the challenges that we've been trying to address is, you know, you, most likely you won't be able to get to the population that's contaminated within 24 hours right. post-event. So we really want to design chelators that have such a high affinity that they're actually capable of removing the radionuclides even from um, the bone matrix in that case or the muscle in the cesium case. Mm -hmm. So in terms of chelating agents, you, uh, you know, the goal is to give it to people. So uh, typically you have the FDA regulation that kicks in, right? So are you, is your strategy to use compounds that are already FDA approved or are you creating de novo compounds that you need to go through FDA approval? How does that work? So we've developed new compounds. Um, one in particular has reached uh, the new investigational, investigational new drug status. So the IND status, it's been approved by the FDA to proceed for um, a first clinical trial where we would assess the safety of the drug itself. So no contamination scenario, we're just looking at side effects or the pharmacology and toxicology of the drug itself. Um, so we're at this point where we have done a lot of experiments in animal models, we've established the efficacy of this chelating agent, we've established the safety in animals, different species, and right now we're getting ready to assess the safety and pharmacology in humans. It's very exciting. So I wanted to finish on uh, an initiative that uh, has uh, just started in, uh, in the Berkeley Lab, uh, where multiple divisions are coming together to deal with the uh, Fukushima incident and other uh, type of incidents such as this one. So I let Rebecca kind of maybe introduce the concept behind it since you were one of the key founder of this idea. Right. So this is um, it's called the, the it's, it is going to be called the Berkeley Institute for Radiological Resilience. Um, and it was started as a collaboration between the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and um, Japanese counterparts and also the Jap Japan Atomic Energy Agency. Um, so we did get a lot of support from the JEA and internal support from LBNL to launch this institute. And the idea is that we're going to assess and evaluate the risks of um, hazards um, due to a radiological incident, so not only um, you know, a nuclear power plant, but just really radiological resilience in general. And that will include efforts in the nuclear sciences fields, such as developing new detectors for mapping um, from aerial uh, components or mapping the um, fluxes of contaminants in the soil, understanding the environmental um, aspects of contamination, and then also the health effects of um, such event. Um, so that we can gather the facts, the scientific facts that will help us um, respond in a more scientifically based basis <laughs> to this event. So really to improve the radiological resilience of people if they were to be um, involved in a, a nuclear or radiological accident. Right. I think what's really unique about the, event, the institute that uh, we're trying to build though is uh, this really this combination of those multiple division and, and expertise because yeah. uh, a nuclear incident like Fukushima really involves everything. You you have the the spraying of the uh, you know the uh, how does the contaminant goes into the nature how does it uh, migrate over time. So these diffusion models have to be written down and, and, and computed. You have you know so yeah actions so mitigation chelating agents uh, measurement that's uh, you know health effect and then. Uh, and then one of the thing, one, one exciting thing is also the ability to monitor. And so um, Kai Vetter, who is the leader of this of this institute, has developed drones that can fly over Fukushima and do mapping of the dose. So it's a very comprehensive approach. Yeah, it sounds like an exciting multidisciplinary endeavor. Absolutely. Right. This is the first time I've heard of it. So. And, and one other key aspect of this initiative is that we're partnering with the University of California at Berkeley 
with different um, the School of Public Health, the Nuclear Engineering Department, um, Education and um, Social Sciences Department as well, so that we can actually transpose the scientific evidence into communication and education of the population so that they can really respond um, right away to an accident. Um, well, I think uh, you convinced us that uh, <laughs> killing agents and the corporation is a very big deal. And uh, I wish you all the best with all this work that's waiting for you. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.